Hello, thank you so much for joining us again. I'm Duncan Fraser, Director of the charity Useful and Kind Unlimited, and we're trying to help people to be more useful and kind. And this video is going to look at why we are useful and kind, and a later video will look at what are the challenges to us being useful and kind. So I just wondered if we might start with what is it to be useful and kind? What do we mean by it? Well, earlier videos have looked at this, and you might like to look them up on our website, in terms of our SO model. So just to remind you that being useful and kind to self, others, the easy ones, the difficult ones, the teams, uh, and the world. Um, and there are lots of words that come to mind when we think about being useful and kind. Um, utility and generosity is the way we're looking at it. But the word prosocial is used a lot, especially by psychologists who study this. Um, empathy. We've seen how empathy is really important to this process, and that's feeling the feelings of the other person, whatever they are. Uh, sympathy is a feeling sad for someone else's misfortune. But what we're really interested in at Useful and Kind is compassion. That's to say, feeling the feelings, feeling moved and stirred to do something and then doing something about it. Um, and I just thought it'd be useful in this video as we're looking at why we are useful and kind, what helps us and tells us to be so, is if we think about the current climate of the huge amount of useful and kindness that's going on in the world. The huge number of volunteers, 750,000 people volunteers for the NHS in the UK and many were turned away. There is a desire there to reach out and help others at the moment, whether it's buying food for neighbours or making masks or volunteering. So it's in that context that I thought it might be actually quite useful to look at the kind of things that Useful and Kind has researched as to why we are Useful and Kind. So there are three aspects that we're going to look at. The first is genetic. The second are the five norms of prosociality. And thirdly, we're going to look at why we are useful and kind to others in order to help ourselves. So let's start with the gene stuff. Well, this predates people. Uh, there's a fantastically interesting study by the Canadian uh, Susan Simar, uh, and there's a great TED talk uh, that uh, she has made about her research around the ways in which trees communicate. They're not just individual trees, but there's a whole community of trees that communicate with each other. Uh, they pass carbon and nutrients through mycorrhiza, and it's between species as well. It's not just oak talking to oak. Um, and they help each other to communicate and to fight disease and to warn each other if disease is coming. The second aspect of uh, the genes information is, again, another TED talk by Dustin Daniels, who's shown that uh, there can be prosociality across species. So, for instance, um, monkeys and fruit bats share food. Um, crows and squirrels alert each other when there's danger. Um, Genetically, from an evolutionary perspective, early human survival depended strongly on processes of giving and helping. And interestingly, what um, psychologists and biologists have shown is that it was actually the survival of the most cooperative, not of the fittest. If two groups are in direct competition with one another, the group with the larger number of altruists will have an advantage. And we have a desire to belong to a group. Um, 
there's a really interesting study uh, at the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology that's demonstrated that by one or two between those ages, we are already helping each other. Um, toddlers will want to help even if they're prevented from doing so and they're relieved when help is given even if it hasn't been they who give the help. The other kind of obvious aspect of being useful and kind and this will also appear when we look at why we might not be is the issue of proximity. We are most likely to help those we love or know first. So you think of when we were in tribes on the savannah, um, we would help what's called by psychologists the in-group. Now, what's really interesting at the moment, of course, is that we are far from that. We are obviously helping our friends and family, be it by Zoom or FaceTime or whatever else. We're shopping for them if they're in need. Um, but we can and are helping lots of people. Now, that's really interesting because it helps us look at how we might be useful and kind to those who are different to us. And I'll do a whole video about that. So that's the genetic bit. Let's now look at the five norms. Uh, so the first of these is reciprocity. That means we may help you because you might help me in the future. And that's especially true of those we don't know. Whilst we might give the benefit of the doubt to those who are close, then we will just look at, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Um, the second norm is equity. We give benefits in proportion to those we receive. So... Um, if someone loans us a fiver, um, we're more likely to loan than a fiver too. The third norm is social responsibility. Just because someone needs it and it's the right thing to do. Uh, think of, uh, in general times, money that people give to charity where there's no expectation that they will get anything back other than a little self-esteem and self-approbation. That, that will certainly be the case with the NHS volunteers who in many cases will be in fact putting themselves in danger and at risk. Um, the fourth norm is we're told to. Where do we learn it's the right thing to do? So just pause for a minute and think what did your parents or primary caregivers or authority figures say when you were little? about being useful and kind? Was it expected? Did you live in fear of a judgment if you didn't, whether that was parental or religious? Did it get stroked? Did it get noticed? What instructions were given to you as children? We're told it's right. Little children sharing toys with the phrase, play nicely. What were the messages from your religion, if you have one? You know, the famous story of the Good Samaritan, to give and not to count the cost. In his case, it was at some cost because it was certainly not an in-group recipient of his beneficence and pro-sociality. Then there is, of course, across all religions and no faiths, the idea of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Then the Buddhists have that wonderful principle of dependent origination. That's that our own happiness is dependent on the happiness of others. I.e. we can only be happy when others are. And that's tough in a world that's so unjust and unfair. I also love that idea of Ubuntu. This idea that 
I am who I am because of who we are. The idea of no man or person is an island. I wonder if for you there was a message of a kind of judgment day, an ultimate exam in being useful and kind. Uh, does your reward come in heaven or later? And does the motivation and the guilt that comes around that negate the outcome? And if you think of a norm, then a, a great example at the moment, of course, that we all know is the wonderful Greta. Um, and in her case, what is it? Is it a mixture of her parents, her culture, or her sudden connection that day with how wrong the world was and how she felt she could have traction and be useful and kind to make a difference to the environment. And the fifth norm is that this behaviour gets reinforced. So the toddler does something that's useful and kind and then gets praised for it and then repeats it. So the third big category is that we do help others to help ourselves. And there's been a lot of really interesting research around what's called the wounded healer. That's to say we relieve our own pain by relieving that of others. And we can do that by sharing our own pain, by learning about it therapeutically or psychologically, by sharing it. Uh, there are many people in the health professions who have this. There's a sense of healing their own trauma by treating it in others. There's a wonderful example of a great friend of Useful and Kind, Laura Darrell, who, after she'd had some mental health concerns, when she came out of it, she knew that she wanted to help people. And there's a picture of her on the front of our website. And she uh, stuck a post-it on her head, hashtag it affects me, uh, with the invitation for everyone else to do that, who was affected by mental health, whether they were a friend, a family member, a colleague, and so on. And uh, this is now being circulated many millions of times throughout the world. And that's a wonderful example of the inspirational Laura, the wounded healer. Uh, we also now know from research done by Liz Dunn in 2014, what we knew all along, which is it's better to give than receive. So she gave out $50 to a bunch of students Psychology research is always a bunch of students. However, she gave them $50 and said, go and spend it on yourself. And she measured the increase in happiness in their personal subjective well-being. And the following day, she gave them all $50 um, or a different group. I think she gave a different group $50 and said that they were to give it to someone else. And, of course, you know what's coming, which is the subjective well-being of the individual giver increased more than it did for the person who was spending it on themselves. Um, another part of helping ourselves is the way we feel good when we pay it forward. This is a big thing now, and there are lots of different ways in which you can pay it forward. You can pay for someone's coffee without them knowing about it um, and a lot of the random acts of kindness have been about money but they don't need to be they simply need to be a nice gesture a nice stroke of thought um, doing something for someone I wonder if you can think of a small gesture that you could do today for someone and be fully aware of your expectations as you do it. Do you want praise? Do you want recognition? How can you develop this sense of giving and not counting the cost? 
the idea of paying it forward is a very strong one. Uh, I benefited hugely from my first coach mentor who, when I was a chief exec at the end of a project, continued to see me free for some time. And I've paid this uh, forward many times since. And uh, it's a wonderful way to think about how we can be useful and kind in the world. So, it might be helpful for you to look at the SO model and just to think about that for yourself. You can find it on our website under resources and tools. Just download it, print it for yourself and look at the way in which you are useful and kind to self, others and world and just think about these contexts. The genetic component, the norms, where it came from for you, your culture, your religion, your parents and think about to what extent you are helping yourself. Now, as far as useful and kind is concerned, it is, as we've said, not just about self, and it's not just about the easy ones. So I'm just wondering that difficult question of who would you find it most difficult to be useful and kind to? And if you train as a therapist, it's often a question that's asked in training. Who do you think you would find it most difficult to work with or couldn't work with? And people will say a uh, murderer or an abuser. And part of our process, of, as we've seen, is, is just trying to explore what there is of those people in us, as we covered in a separate video. Uh, there are some truly inspirational examples of this. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the Forgiveness Project. Look them up. Absolutely amazing. Think about the Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa. Speaking a kind truth to power. So, I just invite you to... Consider some or all of that in a journal or in a conversation with someone uh, just to explore your own pro-sociality. Thank you so much for your time today. If you've any questions or queries, please reach out to me, Duncan at UsefulAndKindUnlimited.com. Stay well. Thank you.